Today's sermon text is Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, this morning we pick up where we left off in our series in Genesis, as Ali just read. We are in chapter 4 this morning. You'll remember in chapters 1 and 2, God creates the world and blesses the man and the woman, providing them one another and everything good to enjoy, commissioning them to rule and subdue the earth. Chapter 1, verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But sin enters the world in chapter 3, and everything begins to unravel. If chapter 3 describes sin's entrance into the world, chapter 4 describes its tragic spread. We see a clear development and escalation of man's sin, a further hardening of the human heart against God. Something else you notice is that chapter 3 highlights the deception of the serpent. Chapter 4 explains our sinful nature and the birth of a sinful civilization that has no need for God. So we see the world, the flesh, and the devil arrayed against God in the opening chapters of the Bible. It is dark and ominous, and the results are heartrending. We see the murder of the innocent, the overturning of God's good design of one man and one woman in marriage. We see actual boasting and the slaying of fellow image bearers. God's words to the serpent in chapter 3, verse 15, keep getting pulled forward as the story unfolds. You remember God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this enmity, this conflict between these two lines of people begins in this chapter. It's a theme that runs through the rest of Genesis and throughout the scriptures. Great evil is carried out in opposition to God and his people. And there's a building tension and longing that one would finally come to put an end to it. When this passage, the seed of the serpent appears to have the upper hand. But as black and bleak as it seems, a glimmer of hope remains. God's promise endures. Often in hidden, unexpected ways, in the midst of great wickedness, God is just and he remains faithful to his promise. The line of the seed of the woman will be preserved, pointing to the day when one comes to finally crush the head of the serpent. And I hope everyone here knows his name. If you don't, you will by the end of the sermon. So four points we'll walk through. Number one, the seed hoped for. Second, the seed murdered. Third, the seed of Cain. And lastly, the seed preserved. So first, the seed hoped for. Adam and Eve, having broken the command of the Lord, they've been driven out of the garden. 
But in God's judgment, we see his mercy. He has not immediately taken their lives. He's clothed them. He's covered their shame. And they're blessed with children. They're carrying out what God told them to do, to, to bear fruit, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. By faith, Adam calls his wife's name Eve, chapter 3, verse 20, because she was the mother of all living. So her name means life giver. Adam is trusting the word of God that through Eve, a promised son will be born who will overturn the curse. Their firstborn is a son who they name Cain, which means acquire or possess. Uh, You hear uh, the meaning of his name in what Eve says. Uh, She says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. So she rightly acknowledges God's help in the birth of this child. What has happened is not merely natural. Uh, Her words are the words of faith. Yet what she says also reveals a certain expectation. There's a hint here that she thinks Cain is the promised son. I have gotten a man. My husband and I, we're going to be back in paradise in no time. She won't be the last person to hope in a child in this way. In chapter 5, verse 28, there's a man named Lamech. It's not the same one as in chapter 4. We'll get to him later. But this Lamech has a son named Noah. And Lamech says, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. So you see this longing that continues for one to come to defeat the seed of the serpent and to give them rest from the painful toil of the curse. Further evidence that Eve is pinning her hopes on Cain is the lack of fanfare over the birth of his brother. Verse 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. That's all we get. In fact, Abel's name means vanity or breath, vapor. You might say worthless. The firstborn has been acquired. Cain's all we need. So Eve is trusting in God, but her expectation is that God will move immediately. And we we have this tendency as well, don't we? we? We want to see God move in our time. But so often God moves in a fashion we would not expect, at a pace we would not choose, through means that seem to defy the very goal we thought we were shooting for. So one thing to settle in your minds before we go any further is that whatever God does, he is right. Whatever he does, it is right. God is just. God is not arbitrary. Whatever he does, he is worthy of our trust. You see the prophesied conflict between the two seeds shaping up, and the crime will be appalling. It will be carried out in the context of worship and between brothers. So now we turn to the seed murdered. Both brothers bring an offering to the Lord. An offering rightly given was a sacrificial declaration to God. I have received this from you. I I, I humbly acknowledge that you are the ruler and provider. I thank you. That's how an offering should be given. Their offerings are linked to their occupations. Cain is a farmer. Abel is a shepherd. Cain's offering is produce. Abel's offering is sheep. But we're told in verse 4 that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Why is that? Well, we're not explicitly told. It can't be that being a shepherd is better than being a farmer. Uh, Their father, Adam, was appointed by God to work and keep the garden. It's a noble task ordained by God. It can't be that animal sacrifices are better than plant offerings. Both are recognized in the law. Something else is going on here. An offering is not magic. You know, just do this, follow this formula, then God will be pleased with you. No, God is always concerned with the heart of the worshiper. To accept a person's offering is to accept the person. So do you see how the worshiper and the worshiper's offering are linked in the eyes of God? And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, 
He had no regard. So the two are linked. The offering reveals the worshiper. And we get a hint of the heart disposition of the two brothers by what they offer. Abel brings of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. He gives of the very best from his flock and what was considered to be the the very best part of the animal. Cain, on the other hand, brings an offering of the fruit of the ground. Another translation says, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So it it seems like a token offering. It doesn't cost him much. Cain's offering does not express devotion to God or, or childlike gratitude or trust. But Abel's offering does. Abel trusted in God. That's precisely how the author of Hebrews interprets this story. He says, by faith... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So faith was the decisive difference. Childlike dependence on God that is then evidenced by righteous deeds. A tree will be known by its fruits. Cain looked dutiful and religious. He brings an offering, but his heart was crooked. His offering reveals his heart. So friends, what a moment here to examine our own hearts and our service to God and the offerings we bring to him and the good deeds we carry out. What is the state of our hearts? Are we serving for the sake of human applause or out of dutiful tradition or or because, you know, we live in the South and this is what a good Christian is supposed to do? In your worship, where is your heart? Does your heart overflow with sacrificial deeds and offerings simply because you love God? Isn't this how you, you want to live, to be so captivated by God that you're compelled to, to give your very lives for, for his sake, to freely relinquish your time and your comfort and your convenience and your privacy for the sake of other people and their spiritual good. I do want to speak, though, to the overly scrupulous souls among us. You'll, you'll never, you're never going to reach the bottom of your motives for serving God. Of course they're tainted. But the good news is we can bring that to God as well, can't we? We can just say, Lord, you you know my fickle heart. I I confess that. I I ask for your help. And then we can get right back to serving. There's there's no need to be incapacitated by navel-gazing, okay? So he welcomes us as we come to him in childlike faith. But that's not where Cain is. His heart is further revealed as the story continues. His response to God's disfavor is not humility or repentance or mourning or crying out for forgiveness. The text says Cain was very angry and his face fell. So something that was already there has been provoked. It's it's been touched off. And we'll see this in the Bible again, that being very angry, that Hebrew phrase, is a prelude to murder. As their names indicate, Cain was likely raised by his parents as the favored one, entitled to privileges, exalted. But now God is turning the tables on him. And so he's angry at God and he's jealous of his brother. And here God teaches us the anatomy of our sin, even in the opening pages of the Bible, how it works, how it develops. It's actually the first time the word sin is used in the scriptures right here. God mercifully intervenes and he reasons with Cain. Why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. So God in great kindness is explaining to Cain the nature of his own heart in a fallen world. He knows what Cain is hatching. God essentially says, Cain, you don't have to carry this out. You you are not a helpless victim. You do not have to give in to Satan. You do not have to give full vent to the sin in your heart. You have to fight. Look to me. Look to my counsel. You see how merciful God is with him here. 
It's like a parent instructing a child, why are you angry? What's going on in your heart? You have to know sin grows. It will take more and more of you. Don't give in to it. Well, God tells him the true nature of his enemy as well. Sin is like a demonic creature crouching at the door, ready to spring if it's given an opening. It's a picture of the serpent. It's coiled. It's ready to to seize its prey. Its desire is for you. Don't open the door. It's truly amazing what God tells him. In a moment of crisis, Cain receives sound counsel from God himself, but he doesn't listen. So Eve had to be talked into sinning here. God tries to talk him out of it. But he doesn't listen. Instead of continuing the dialogue with God, he speaks to his brother. With malice in his heart, he plunges right into his premeditated plan. He draws Abel out to the field. It's an isolated spot. Nobody's going to see. Nobody's going to come to Abel's rescue. And Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. His own brother. It's not a stranger, it's not an enemy. It's his own brother. And Moses draws attention to this by using the word brother twice in verse 8. He emphasizes the wickedness of the deed. Whether you have a beloved sibling or not, this scene should rock you. It is scandalous. It's beyond description. The brevity of the scene highlights its horror. His little brother, the worthless one, is lying dead out in a field. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? We hear an echo of the question God asked his father after he had sinned, Adam, where are you? And of course, God knew full well where Adam was, and he knows where Abel is. But with this question, God is unbelievably giving Cain an opportunity to confess his sin, to come clean with it. Does God hold men and women accountable for their actions? Yes, he does. But friends, God is slow to anger. His mercy is ready to burst forth at the first glimpse of contrition. Jonathan Edwards, theologian of the 18th century, said, He is a God that delights in mercy and judgment is his strange work. The only reason people do not enjoy the boundless love of God is their settled unbelief and their rebellion against him. That's where Cain is. How does he answer God's question? Where is Abel, your brother? He tells a bold-faced lie. I do not know. And then he has the gall to question God. Am I my brother's keeper? One commentator called Cain's question an impertinent witticism. I grew up in Georgia. We just call it sass. It, <laughs> it's of the worst sort. Cain expresses zero remorse. And, and here we're seeing the ugly and heartbreaking progress of sin in the human heart. When Adam was questioned, he told the truth. If not the whole truth, he told the truth. But Cain tells a straight up lie and then he mockingly questions God. He never confesses his deed. In fact, the only thing we hear from Cain is a complaint over his punishment and fear that somebody's going to kill him. So the hardening of the human heart with its mutiny against God and its selfish preoccupation is on full display. Cain was his brother's keeper. He should have been the first to come to his brother's help. And the Israelites reading this would have picked that up right away. Brothers were to act as redeemers of their slain family members, avenging their blood. Instead, Cain is the perpetrator himself. It's a staggering sin against God. But one we are familiar with. We we don't want to admit it. But Paul outlines the desires of the flesh in Galatians 5 accurately. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, 
dissensions, divisions, envy. Do any of those words smite your conscience this morning? Have you ever been so angry at someone, so jealous of their position, their possessions, their talents, their favor in the eyes of others that you wanted to take them down? The Apostle John writes, we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. John says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. So, brothers and sisters, we've got to keep a close watch on each other. Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for us. I've read this to you before, but, but it fits here as well. This is John Owen, theologian of the 17th century. He writes, sin aims always at the utmost Every time it rises up to tempt or entice, might it have its own course, it would go out to the utmost sin in that kind. Every unclean thought or glance would be adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. Every thought of unbelief would be atheism, might it grow to its head. That's where sin wants to take you. The flesh wants to give birth to a perfect sin. Friends, don't do it. Listen to the word of God. He holds out merciful hands ready to provide for you. He's provided us one another so we can help each other. James says, confess your sins one to another. I heard this line recently, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Bring your sins into the light before God and a few close friends here at the church and your appetite to continue down sin's path will begin to evaporate. And this is to say nothing of the promised son who would come to die for your pardon and purchase your holiness. But I haven't gotten to him yet. So have we, we've seen Cain spurned the counsel of God and he just said, no thanks. He carried out his wicked deed, and God calls him to account. Verse 10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. So two things we learn here. Uh, this one sentence carries with it a whole theology that would inform Israel's criminal law. Leviticus 17, verse 11, life is in the blood. We'll learn in Genesis 9 that homicide must be avenged because man is made in God's image. Murder must be atoned for. Shed blood polluted the land. If it's not dealt with, God would withdraw from his people. Secondly, we learn God cares about the death of the innocent. He says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me. Cain won't fess up, but the blood speaks. God sees, God knows, and God hears the cries of the afflicted. And he will have vengeance. God pronounces his doom. Verse 11, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So many interesting parallels between Adam's fall and Cain's fall. Both found sinful desires in their hearts. Both acted on it. Afterwards, God comes to both with a question. Both must depart from the presence of the Lord. Both go east of Eden. We see that in verse 16. And in both cases, their punishment is related to the working of the ground. To Adam, God said, in pain you shall eat of it. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. But Cain's punishment is more severe. God says, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. So Cain will still work the ground, but he's going to get minimal results. And most striking, God tells Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. But to Cain, God says, you are cursed from the ground. 
As there is an escalation of sin, there is an escalation in its consequences. So Cain is being banished. He's being sent away from the cultivated area. And all family relationships are now broken, even with God. Adam and Eve accepted the judgment of God in silence. But in verses 13 and 14, Cain complains, saying his punishment is too severe. He's afraid someone will find him and kill him. So I know you're asking, so there's other folks walking around right now? Where did they come from? Uh, It's not really a question Moses felt he had to address. Uh, It could be Cain is speaking about people yet to be born. Uh, We do read in chapter 5, verse 4, the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Uh, Not really sure. But to his fear... God says, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Sevenfold uh, means fullness. Uh, So God promises full divine vengeance on anyone who kills Cain. And he puts a mark on Cain to ward off anyone who would dare try. We don't don't know what the mark was. Tattoo, different haircut, who knows. Um, The point is, just as God had made garments of skin for Adam and Eve to clothe them, he puts a mark on Cain to protect him. Again, we see God's mercy in the midst of judgment, even for Cain. It's truly remarkable. This is what our God is like. Verse 16, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So this will be the last time the Lord is mentioned until verse 25. Verses 17 through 24, we learn of Cain's descendants. Evidently, his sins continue in his lineage. So now we look at the seed of Cain. We do see good culture creating endeavors in Cain's line. Humanity continues to expand and multiply. We we see the forming of cities. We see the first tent dwellers, the managing of livestock, musical instruments, the forging of metal. These are good things. They're, They're carrying out the cultural mandate to rule and subdue the earth. But there's no mention of God whatsoever. In fact, what overshadows all the technological advancements in this section is the barbarism of a man named Lamech. He's the first polygamist. He's not satisfied with God's good design of one man and one woman for life. He perverts the one flesh union with two wives. And in a sickening way, he calls his wives to him to listen to him boast about how he kills a young man who had merely struck him. Lamech resembles Cain, but he's worse. Cain gives in to sinful desire. Lamech brags about it. So we continue to see the escalation of sin. He says, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. So this guy is parading in his violence. He's not hiding in the trees. He is flaunting his sin. Lamech's family might be known for architecture and crafting metal, but evidently they cannot manage themselves. This passage teaches us that all aspects of human culture have been stained by Cain's sin and the sin of his father before him. And clearly, we we, we see this down to our very day, don't we? We have incredible advancements in technology, but we are fracturing from the inside, glutting ourselves on imaginative evil, and, and we don't know how to help ourselves. This is nothing new. It would seem at this point in the narrative that all hope is lost. Eve was at first triumphant. I have gotten a man. But clearly Cain is not the promised son who would crush the head of the serpent. No, he murders the younger righteous son. Cain is not the serpent crusher. He's the serpent follower. And Jesus said that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. That that is a clear reference to Cain. And Cain's line only deepens the darkness. But a line Tom has shared with us a few times, I love this. The night is darkest just before the first hint of sunrise. 
All hope is not lost. God will preserve his chosen seed. So finally, we come to the seed preserved. If you look at verse 25, we haven't heard from Adam and Eve since verse 1, but here they are again. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. One commentator says, she can as little forget the murdered as the murderer, for both were her children, and in one sentence she mentions the name of all three sons. So her statement is both tragic and yet beautiful, because it demonstrates that the seed of the woman has not been stamped out. God has appointed another offspring instead of Abel. He's preserving his chosen seed in the midst of great evil against it. So why am I assuming Seth is in God's chosen line? We look at verse 26. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So the proximity of that statement to the birth of Seth and his son is a glimmer of hope. Cain's family may have been the first in technology and cities and fine art, but Seth's family is the first in worship. Cain and Abel had offered sacrifices before, but now worship is a regular public practice, beginning with, with Adam's own family unit. Through Seth's line will come a, a man named Noah, a righteous man, blameless in his generation, who will be one of only a few that emerge after the flood. And through Noah will come the patriarchs who also call upon the name of the Lord. We, we hear that in Abraham and Isaac. God preserves his people through whom the promised one would come. God is faithful. He keeps his word. Though at times we can't make out what he's doing. As it turned out, Abel, the worthless vapor of a man was favored by God, not the legally privileged firstborn. And, and don't we see this over and over? He chose Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. Joseph, not his older brothers. Ephraim, not Manasseh. And David, the youngest of his brothers. God is always upending our expectations, working in a way the world would not choose. How are we made right with God, not by strength, not by human privilege, not by dutiful religion, but through childlike faith in the one God has promised. So chapter 4 begins with a boy named Abel. His name means breath. The chapter ends with Seth's little boy, Enosh. His name means weakness. But it's through such a line of people who are weak and yet dependent on God that the serpent-crushing king will come. This is how our God works. Dark times will return as the story continues. God's promise to send a son will seem to have faded from memory. This ancient enmity, this conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman will rage on. We think of Pharaoh tossing the Hebrew babies into the Nile. And enslaving the Israelites for hundreds of years, we, we think of the evil kings, even within Israel itself, who oppose the prophets of the Lord, down to Herod, who tried to snuff out the Messiah by slaughtering the babies in Bethlehem. But Jesus Christ was born, and he will have the final victory. The author of Hebrews says that we have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. How is it better? Abel's blood cried out for vengeance, and rightly so. But the blood of Jesus cries out for forgiveness. The seed of the woman was preserved for you to rescue you and me from the domain of darkness. For unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. God preserved the seed. God kept his promise. God will keep his church, even through the evil days we are living in. And God will keep you. And whatever you're walking through right now, through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment now and ponder these things. 
reflect on what God has done, that we might glory in him and rest in him. Oh, Lord, thank you for fulfilling your promise and sending the Lord Jesus Christ. We await his return and the consummation of our salvation. Help us to take heart this morning because of your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand together?